Welcome back, everyone, to another deep dive. Today, we're going to be talking about something pretty incredible. We're diving into the world of cancer immunotherapy. It's a really exciting field. Yeah, and we're specifically going to be focusing on a protein called CD70. Yeah, CD70, it's a... It's really fascinating because it's like a, a fingerprint. You know, you find it on certain cancer cells and it's super rare to find on healthy ones. Oh, interesting. So it's a really, really unique target if you want to attack the cancer without harming the rest of the body. So how, how do you target it? Well, one way is uh, there's something called vorsituzumab. Vorsituzumab, okay. What is that? It's what's known as a monoclonal antibody. Basically, they engineer this thing, the lock onto CD70, so it's like a key fitting into a lock. Right. And then this binding, this is the really cool part, this binding uh, triggers the body's own immune system to attack and destroy the marked cancer cells. I'm guessing it's a little more complicated than just flagging them, though, right? Oh, you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's way more complex than just flagging them, for sure. So can you, can you break down how this attack actually happens? Yeah, I can try. It's a... Uh... It's a beautiful process, really. One of the main mechanisms is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Yeah, ADCC for short. ADCC, okay. But basically when this, uh, this vorsituzumab binds to a cancer cell, it's like a signal flare goes up, and this flare attracts these specific immune cells, like natural killer cells. Have you heard of those? I have heard of those, yeah. Yeah, and macrophages, which have receptors that can recognize the antibody. Okay, so the vorsituzumab isn't directly killing the cells then. It's calling in reinforcements from the immune system. That's exactly it. So these immune cells bind to the other end of the vorsituzumab, the part that's not stuck to the cancer cell. And then that binding activated them and it triggers them to release these uh, these toxic substances that can destroy the cancer cell from the outside. Wow. It's incredible how they can figure out these mechanisms and then harness them, you know, to fight cancer. It really is, isn't it? Yeah. But wait, there's more. Oh, there's more. Vortituzumab doesn't just stop there. It can also, in addition to triggering ADCC, it can also interfere with CD70's normal function, which is to help tumors hide from the immune system. Oh, wow. So it's kind of like a double whammy. A double whammy. So it's marking them and disabling their camouflage. Yeah, exactly. That's wild. Now, I see in the research there's also what looks like kind of a supercharged version of vorsituzumab. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're talking about vorsituzumab mafodotum? Vorsituzumab mafodotum, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically the original vorsituzumab, and they link it to what's called a cytotoxic agent. Cytotoxic agent. Yeah, and that's basically a substance that can directly kill cells. So it's like, you know, they mark it with the vorsituzumab and then deliver this lethal dose of this agent directly to that cell. So it doesn't solely rely on the immune system. Right. It has its own built-in weapon. Exactly. That sounds incredibly potent. Are there any downsides to using such a powerful treatment? Well, with anything that potent, Ray, there's always the potential for side effects. Why? One of the uh, one of the challenges with cancer treatment, especially immunotherapy, is finding that sweet spot. Finding the right balance between effectiveness and safety. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. So researchers are still trying to understand the full effects then of both versions. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, ongoing clinical trials, those are super crucial for evaluating, you know, the benefits and the risks of any new treatment, right? And so while we still have much to learn, I mean, the initial results, they're pretty encouraging. That's great, that's great to hear. So this brings us to like the potential applications of vorsituzumab in treating various types of cancer. Yeah. I'm excited to hear more about that. The materials mentioned it being used to treat cancers of the blood, but also solid tumors. Right. Before we dive into each type, can you explain why this one treatment could potentially be effective against so many different kinds of cancers? Yeah, that's a good question. It really all comes down to CD70 expression. So cancers that have high levels of CD70 on their cell surfaces, they are the ones that are most susceptible to vorsituzumab. And that happens to be the case for several types of cancer, including some blood cancers, but also, like you said, some solid tumors as well. Oh, OK. So it's not a universal treatment for all cancers. Right. Yeah. But it's a targeted therapy for the ones with this specific you know, vulnerability. Exactly. And that's why, you know, research into accurately measuring CD70 levels in tumors, that's super important because it helps identify which patients are most likely to benefit 
you know, from this therapy. And it makes sure that we can personalize the treatment as much as possible. Personalized medicine. Yeah. That's a big thing now. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's becoming increasingly important in all kinds of cancer treatments these days. Mm. Are there any other factors researchers are looking at when trying to figure out who might be a good candidate for vorsentuzumab? Yeah, for sure. There are a few things they're looking at. So, of course, you know, the stage and type of cancer play a role. Right. But also the patient's overall health and previous treatments. You know, ha have they had other treatments that have failed? Yeah. Things like that. But that presence of CD70, that remains a key indicator of whether or not vorsetuzumab is going to be successful. Okay, so we've laid the groundwork. We know what CD70 is. We know how vorsetuzumab works to target it. We know that it's present in a bunch of different cancers, making it a promising target for this therapy. So what I'm curious about is what kinds of results are we actually seeing? Can we get into some examples of how it's being used to treat these different cancers? Absolutely. Let's start with what are called hematological malignancies. Those are cancers that affect the blood and bone marrow. Okay. So. Okay. So hematological malignancies, what makes them... Uh, what makes them particularly vulnerable to forcetuzumab? Well, hematological malignancies like, you know, lymphomas and leukemias, they often have like tons of CD70 on their cell surfaces. Oh, okay. So they're like prime targets, you know, as we were saying. Right, right. So are we seeing like, are we seeing promising results then? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the early clinical trials, you know, they've been pretty encouraging. Some patients with what's called relapsed or refractory lymphoma, Basically, that means they haven't responded well to other treatments. Right. They've seen significant tumor shrinkage. Wow. Or even in some cases, complete remission after treatment with vorsetuzumab. Complete remission. That's incredible. So this could be a real game changer for people who have, you know, run out of options. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it offers a new path to explore. And, yeah. you know, the research is ongoing. We're learning more all the time about how to best use it, and who might really benefit from it. Now, you mentioned earlier that researchers are also investigating borsetuzumab's effectiveness against solid tumors. Right. Those are uh, those are notoriously trickier, right? They can be, yeah. Solid tumors, they tend to be more complex, more diverse, right. so they're a little harder to target. Sure. But there has been some progress using borsetuzumab to treat certain types of solid tumors. So, for example, glioblastoma. Glioblastoma, yeah. That's a tough one. That's a brain cancer, right? It is, yeah. It's one of the most challenging ones to treat, for sure. What makes vorsetuzumab a potential treatment option for that? Well, glioblastoma cells, they often have high levels of CD70. Okay. So that makes them potentially susceptible to vorsetuzumab. And so there are, you know, a bunch of clinical trials that are going on right now to investigate whether it can, you know, on its own or in combination with other therapies, if it can control tumor growth and improve survival rates. So even though it's early, you're saying there's hope that it could offer some kind of new way to treat this you know, this really tough disease. Yeah, there's definitely potential there. And it's not just glioblastoma. They're also studying vorsetuzumab for renal cell carcinoma, which is a type of kidney cancer. Okay. And similar to glioblastoma, these cancer cells, they also tend to express high levels of CD70. So it seems like the common thread here. Yeah. The common denominator is the CD70 expression. Exactly. If it's high, then it's a good target. Yeah, and that's why, you know, accurately identifying and measuring those CD70 levels, that's really crucial because, you know, not all cancers express it to the same extent. So it's about figuring out who's really going to benefit from this therapy. So really tailoring the treatment to the individual. Exactly. Personalized medicine, like you said, that's where things are headed. You know, moving away from that one size fits all and really focusing on the individual. Now, this is all incredibly fascinating. And the research seems to be like moving really fast. Yeah. But I have to ask, are there are there any challenges? Are there any limitations with vorsetuzumab? Of course. I mean, with any scientific endeavor, right, there are always challenges. Right. I think one of the key ones with vorsetuzumab and any immunotherapy for that matter is the potential for side effects. Yeah, because even though it's, you know, you're saying it targets cancer cells specifically, there's always that chance it can affect healthy cells. Yeah, right. that's right. And that's why, you know, you have to really meticulously monitor the patients during the clinical trials. And that's also why the research is so important. Right. You know, into how to minimize or manage those potential side effects. So what kind of side effects have been observed? Well, some of the common ones that people have reported in trials include things like, you know, fatigue, nausea, skin reactions, sometimes, you know, in some cases, more serious side effects like liver toxicity or what are called immune-related adverse events. 
Immune-related adverse events, what are those? So basically, you know, when we activate the immune system, like with immunotherapy, right. there's a risk that it can kind of overreact oh, and start okay. attacking healthy tissues. Ah, oh, I see. And this can result in a bunch of different symptoms depending on which organs are affected. So it's something that the researchers and the clinicians are very aware of, and they're actively working on trying to develop ways to, you know, reduce those risks. So it's a tightrope walk. You want to stimulate the immune system enough to fight the cancer, but not so much that it harms the body. That's it. Yeah, that's the balance. And that's what makes all this research so important. You know, we're co constantly learning more and more about the complexities of the immune system and how to fine tune these therapies to get the best results with the least risk. Now, earlier we talked about biosimilars. Right. Can you explain why they're so important? particularly in the development of these new therapies? Sure. So biosimilars, they're essentially highly similar versions of, you know, these really complex biologic drugs like borsitusumab, but they're made at a much lower cost. So are they kind of like the generic version of these innovative drugs? Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. So they offer that same level of safety, purity, potency as the original, but the price is much more affordable. Right. And, you know, that's a big deal in research because, you know, it allows for larger studies, you know, maybe exploring new treatment combinations. And ultimately, it just it speeds up the progress without breaking the bank. That makes sense. Yeah. But if biosimilars are primarily for research, how does that translate to benefits for patients? Well, you know, the research that's done using the biosimilars, that gives us all the data about the drug's effectiveness, the safety, you know, the potential uses. Right. And then that data then informs, you know, how new treatment strategies are developed, and it supports the approval of the original drug for wider use. Oh, okay. So the biosimilar kind of, it facilitates the research, right. which then leads to better treatments later on. Exactly. Yeah. It's a crucial step. So in the case of forcetuzumab, there's actually a specific forcetuzumab biosimilar that's being used. Okay. And it's proving really valuable, you know, for researchers that are exploring these CD7D targeted therapies and it's allowing research that you know might not even be possible otherwise because of the cost of the original drug this all paints a very hopeful picture for the future of cancer treatment i think so it's amazing to see how science is you know, it's leading to these more targeted therapies yeah so much more personalized than it was before yeah, it really is. The field of cancer immunotherapy is it's evolving so rapidly. Yeah. And the CD7 targeted therapies like forcetuzumab, I mean, they're really leading the charge. Before we wrap up, I'd love to get your take on where this field is headed. What are some of the key areas of focus for future research on forcetuzumab and CD70? Well, one of the big ones is, you know, continuing to refine patient selection. Okay. So as we've talked about, not everyone with cancer is going to benefit from forcetuzumab, right? Right. So they're working on developing even more precise ways to figure out who's most likely to respond to this therapy. And that involves, you know, looking at not just the CD70 levels, but other things too, you know, like the tumor microenvironment and the patient's immune profile, all of that. So it's really getting very specific and tailored. Yes, exactly. The more tailored, the better. Another key area is exploring combination therapies. So, you know, we touched on this earlier with the vorsetuzumab mafodotin, mm -hmm. but they're also looking at how vorsetuzumab might work together with other immunotherapy drugs or maybe even chemo or radiation therapy. Oh, yeah. So the idea is to kind of create this synergistic effect, you know, so they all work together to be more effective. So even better outcomes potentially. Yeah, that's the hope. It's all about finding the right combinations, right? Uh -huh. You know, packing a punch against that cancer while keeping the side effects to a minimum. And of course, you know, another really crucial area is, you know, just focusing on the long-term effects of vorsetuzumab. Okay. You know, we need to understand how long these responses last. You know, do patients develop resistance over time? What are the potential long-term side effects? All of that. So there's still a lot to learn, but the progress so far has been pretty remarkable. Oh, yeah, it really has. And that's what makes it so exciting to be in this field, you know? Yeah. We're really making great strides. Right. You know, we're understanding cancers so much better, and we're developing more effective treatments. It's a really incredible time to be involved in all this. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. We talked about the potential applications of vorsetuzumab, yeah. both for the blood cancers and the solid tumors. Right. And we talked about the challenges and the future directions. Mm. Now, we did touch on biosimilars earlier, but I think it's worth kind of you know taking a deeper dive. Sure. What can you tell us about how they're actually developed, tested, and regulated? Happy to. 
The development of a biosimilar, it's a very complex process. You can't just, you know, whip up a copycat version of a drug like this. Right. Of course not. There are very, very strict guidelines in place. So first, you have to prove that it's highly similar to the original. Okay. You know, in terms of its structure, function, and clinical performance. So you were saying it's not just about, like, you know, copying the recipe. You have to prove it behaves the same way in the body. Right. Exactly. It's a whole bunch of studies comparing the biosimilar to the original drug. You know, they look at all sorts of things, like the amino acid sequence of the protein, the size and shape of the molecules. I bet there's tons of testing involved. Oh, yeah, for sure. So first, they do a bunch of preclinical testing, yeah. you know, like lab studies, animal models, all that to assess the safety and how well it works. And then, you know, eventually they do clinical trials with people oh. to make sure that, you know, it really does have the same results as the original drug. So are these trials like the ones they do for a brand new drug? Yeah, pretty similar. You know, they're designed really carefully, you know, with all the ethics and everything. Right. But we already have so much data on the original drug. Right. You know, about its safety and how well it works. Sure. So the trials for the biosimilar can be a little more focused. They're often designed to show what's called equivalence, you know, meaning that it really does perform just as well as the original. That makes sense. So once a biosimilar has gone through all of that, the testing, and it's been shown to be equivalent, mm. what happens then? Well, then it needs approval, right? Yeah. So in the U.S., it's the FDA that looks at them. Right, the Food and Drug Administration. Right, and they have this super thorough review process for biosimilars. You know, they go over everything, all that data, from the studies, the testing, the trials, yeah. all to be absolutely sure that the biosimilar meets the same standards as the original drug. So they don't just, like, give it a pass. They really scrutinize these things. Oh, yeah. They have to, you know, to protect people and make sure that it's truly comparable to the original. And even once it's approved, it's still monitored, you know? Oh, wow. For safety and everything, just like any other drug. Wow. It's a long process. It is. Well, now I understand biosimilars is way better. It seems clear that they're really important, you know, to research. Yeah. They make these treatments more affordable. Right. More accessible. But do you think they're going to have an impact beyond research? You know, could they make these treatments more affordable for just regular patients? That's a great question. I think a lot of people are excited about that possibility. Yeah. You know, one of the main goals with developing biosimilars is to, you know, to help more people get these life-saving treatments. Right. If they're more affordable, then maybe they won't be such a burden, you know, for patients. Right. And for the healthcare system. Yeah, that would be huge. It would. But I'm guessing there are some challenges to overcome, right, before biosimilars become, like, more widely used. Yeah, definitely. I think one of the biggest challenges is just, you know, education, doctors, patients, they need to understand what biosimilars are. Yeah. How they're made, how they're tested, how they compare to the original drugs. Right. And there's also just logistical stuff. Okay. You know, making sure they're available. Right. That insurance will cover them, things like that. It sounds like there's more work to be done. There is. But the potential benefits are, you know, are, are really enormous. They are. Not just for research, but for, you know, for patients. Absolutely. And that's why we have to keep talking about them, you know, and support policies that help them be developed and used. Well, this has been an amazing deep dive. We learned so much about CD70 yeah. and forcetuzumab and how important biosimilars are. Is there anything else you want to leave our listeners with? I think the main thing to remember is that these CD70 targeted therapies, they're a huge step forward, yeah. you know, in how we fight cancer. It's a targeted approach, you know, using the power of the immune system and the research that's being done and the development of these biosimilars. Yeah. It's leading to a future where these incredible treatments are going to be available to more people. That's fantastic. That's a great message of hope. It really shows how much progress is being made. It is. It's exciting. Well, thanks for joining us. It's been an honor to learn all of this with you. No, oh, the pleasure was all mine. I always love talking about this stuff. And to our listener, thank you for joining us for this deep dive into CD70 and cancer immunotherapy. We hope you learned a lot. And we encourage you to, you know, keep learning about this stuff. Stay informed. There's so much happening in this field.